All right, well, uh, welcome everyone to this talk about uh, machine learning in .NET. I'm excited to have you here. I'm excited to be in Missouri Springfield, at least uh, uh, partially virtually. I've never been. I had to Google it where it was on a map, uh, and it's kind of fun to... I wish I would have been there in person, but I'm happy to be with you digitally today. So we're going to talk a bit about uh, machine learning.net today, and I will try to keep the slide at a minimum, uh, and then we'll dive into the code and actually create a machine learning model from scratch. Uh, all the way to the end here, but I do want to put some lines of uh, some slides first as well to just set the basis here for people that may not have a background in machine learning to understand what we're doing. So a bit about myself first. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP in uh, developer technologies uh, and uh, I'm really passionate about ML.NET and machine learning uh, so much that I actually uh, stream about it uh, twice a week on Tuesdays and Saturdays and this is how Dave found me as well. Um, I primarily work on an uh, open source library that uh, complements uh, ML.NET uh, to kind of manage the lifecycle. But I also on Saturday teach um, uh, ML.NET together with uh, a gentleman from India as well. Uh, in May, uh, some of you may have seen, uh, we had a virtual conference on ML.NET that was attended by about 700 people uh, worldwide. And we had speakers from uh, seven countries, I think. And that was uh, a lot, a lot of fun. So the community is growing. Uh, if you want to be part of the community, I would uh, be more than happy to, uh, to introduce you to the Slack community we have and everything else and just kind of uh, join in. We, we'd love to have more people uh, participate. But today, we're going to talk about our, uh, primarily a couple of things here. First off, we're going to kick off a little bit, just a few slides about machine learning in general, get the idea and the thoughts about it what it is and what it's not, uh, and why it's kind of important to start learning. Uh, then I want to focus uh, quite a bit of time on the model lifecycle, because machine learning is all good, you know, we can talk about that all day, but it doesn't really matter if you don't have the process written down. And I'm a software engineer, and I think you are primarily as well. And if you come from that kind of background, you need a structure and you need to understand what, what are the pillars, what are the things we repeat all the time? Uh, and that is the, the model life cycle. What are the steps we have to take to train a machine learning model? Because regardless of, of what kind of model you're training, you're going to follow the same steps all the time. Uh, and then we'll dive into ML.NET uh, before we go in and write some code uh, and try to train a classifier together. All right, hope that sounds good. So to start off things, what is machine learning? And I mean, you kind of all know it, I'm sure. You see it all around you every day. Like you have your Siri, you have Google Home, you have your photos. Uh, we get all kinds of stuff around us today. But what is it really if you want to start diving into it and start training something yourself? Well, I always summarize it as programming the unprogrammable because that's how I see it. There are problems out there that you can't really solve with uh, computer science and software engineering. You could. If you want to spend an infinite amount of time to write if uh, and else loops and for loops and things like that to account for every permutation that you can think of. And the issue is that the permutations and ideas are just infinite. So you would end up writing infinite amount of if loops uh, statements uh, and still, still don't get you anywhere. So machine learning is kind of there to help you generalize some problems and generalize some things uh, to get a good outcome uh, and predict things for you as you go forward. To me, machine learning uh, is really cool, especially deep learning as well. Uh, and something that I keep thinking about a lot when I think about machine learning is uh, generative uh, uh, neural networks, which is deep fakes. Uh, some people may have seen this video, but I want to show you kind of the impact it has on me as well. And I realized I didn't connect with uh, the audio, so I'm going to reshare so you can hear it. Tired debris from old Las Vegas, whose former fans have long dismissed allegiance to impressionists. How many opportunities passed up and wasted because he's hell bound to follow what he must? Pity the poor impressionist. Doomed to live an abject failure, <laughs> dogged by his own echolalia. Better to crumble into dust than wind up an impressionist. Deserved for Buddy Moan, that creature with the microphone. All right. So we're going to try to go to the next slide here. So uh, what you saw there was an impressionist, of course. It was one person, one person all the time, 
and the machine learning algorithm imposed the person's face on top of that person. So he kind of switched out the face all the time as he was speaking. So he was, uh, you know, he, he didn't need to say anything because the machine learning model both changed his voice as well as his facial expression. And that's called deep fakes. And that's definitely the cutting edge of machine learning. And it's something that you would never be able to program yourself. Uh, I think it's really, really cool. Uh, we won't really talk about those things today, but just in general, have an idea of what things you can do with machine learning. But when it comes to machine learning though, there are things that, uh, that are artifacts of this process. And the end goal for all these things is to create a model. And the model always comes after doing something called training. And I'm sure you heard that term mentioned a lot. What training really does is that it eats up tons of data and it iterates over the data until it finds suitable parameters that fits the data uh, in such a way that it can you know, kind of uh, predict the outcomes of unseen data. So for example, we can feed it tons of uh, property values and property data from like historical wise. And then on Redfin or uh, Silo, uh, you will see you know, your house value predicted for the next month or so. Just because it has that historical data, it's been trained on that, and then you have a new uh, line of data for your month and you'll get a new value out. So that's kind of the whole training process. But if you look under the surface, what a model really is, a model is nothing more than math. And we're not gonna to talk too much about a math today, but it's two terms I want you to focus on. And those are labels and features, because that's two terms that are being thrown a lot, around a lot in the data science community. Features is the columns in your data set. So those are things that change and that's things that varies. So for example, in a house prediction case, uh, it could be number of bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, and so, and so forth. The label is the price of predicting, and that's the answer. So always when we hear the word label, Label is the answer and features is uh, the data we're using to get that answer. And within that equation, you know, we have tons of so-called coefficients, biases, and weights. And those are the things that are getting adjusted when you train to make sure that your data and your equation here fits the expected outcome. So uh, without going too deep here in machine learning terms, there are three main types of machine learning. There are more, of course, uh, but these are the ones that are most commonly used. And uh, those are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. You will most commonly uh, get good use cases for your business for supervised learning, because that's the most commonly used and has the most business impact. Um, so supervised learning is something where you have labels already on your data. So you know the answer. So that could be like a uh, spam filter, for example, we have a log of uh, uh, emails that are deemed spam and not spam. And you can train the model to detect those things for you. Or you can have an email client that filters your uh, sales email as uh, potential clients or like not interested uh, based on your previous history with them and your success. So those are classifier ideas there. Regression also falls into this if you want to predict the uh, prices, uh, for new things going forward and those kind of things. But the idea here is supervised learning, you always know your past history and you train your model to understand that past history and make predictions in the future. Unsupervised learning is without labels. So we don't know the answer. We just want to look at the data relationships. And a good example of that is clustering. So you can think of that you have clients uh, and you're doing a marketing campaign on one of them and it goes really, really well. And now you want to do the same campaign on another client or another client. Uh, you just don't know if it's going to be successful or not. So you can cluster your clients to understand how related they are uh, in like a three dimensional space. And you don't know what each cluster means. It could be, for example, like high end customers or low end customers, but the model won't label that for you because it has no labels. It will just tell you they are similar in some way or another. And that will be able, that will be helpful for you to understand if, you can then apply the same kind of campaign on this client as well. You also find things like anomaly detection in this kind of family of things uh, and PCA, which is principal component analysis, which is also used in other clustering technology. Uh, finally here, which we won't talk about to today too much is reinforcement learning. I'm mentioning it mostly because it's up and coming a lot and you see it a lot in game development, especially. Uh, you also see in Azure, Azure has a reinforcement learning service uh, where you can more or less uh, uh, train a model uh, with a feedback mechanism. But the idea here is that we just uh, train the model with uh, you know, uh, rewards and, uh, and kind of punishment in some ways. 
So we will reward it if it was correct and we'll punish it if it wasn't correct. And it will slowly kind of learn those intrinsics and those relationships. So very up and coming, but not so useful in many scenarios right now. All right, so before we dive into the code here, how do we train a model? What are the common steps that we need to take to do that? Well, the machine learning life cycle is this. If there's any slide you should take away from this talk today, it's this slide right here. These are the general steps that you need to do to train a machine learning model. The first thing always is to gather your data. If you don't have your data, uh, there's nothing to do. You then you split your data, transform your data, train your model, evaluate and deploy your model to production. There's a lot. So what I want to do is dive into each one of them a bit and understand what it means. But um, I'll definitely share the slides later, but this is like the common kind of theme to go through a model training process. Well, before you even do that though, the first thing you need to do is identify your problem. And uh, when I talk about machine learning with people, this is usually where they fail, honestly, because they don't understand what you can do, what problems can you solve with machine learning and what can't you solve? And what kind of problem is it? So there are a couple of different ML tasks, as we call them. Uh, and it's important to learn what they are and uh, uh, what you can do with them. And there are only like five of them or so. But once you figure those out, you can then have the documentation underneath to get everything else sorted for you easily. But in general, it's things like classification. Like, are we trying to predict if it's a broccoli on this picture or a tomato? That's classification. And specifically, it's multi-classification. Are we trying to predict like a price? That's regression or forecasting. Or um, are we trying to do a recommendation engine for your Spotify or something like that? So there's different kind of ML tasks, and there are not too many of them, like five or six, but try to figure out where your problem fits first before you start diving into the model building and uh, things will just be much easier after that. But once you have the uh, general idea of what you're trying to solve, the next thing is to gather your data. And this is generally the hardest thing to do because gathering your data uh, is super important. With like a bad data set, you will get a bad model. And uh, I was actually in discussion today with, uh, with a community peer of mine. He's trying to train a model uh, on uh, fraud, I think. And he's getting a, a crap model out. It's just impossible to train a model. Whatever he throws at it, you just get like no predictability whatsoever. And the reason is because his data doesn't make any sense. There's just not enough columns on it. There's not enough features. There's not enough rows on it. And the data is, is dirty in general. So focus on this step a lot. Try to get data both from your company, but also from like uh, public sites. You have like Google has public data sets. Uh, so does Microsoft and AWS. You can find a lot of open data sets that you can use to build your machine learning models on. And you can couple them together as well here. So definitely have a look at that. Once you have your data, you want to slice it up into two portions normally. One portion is going to be the data you train your model on. And one, you're gonna put away and hide from your model. And that's called a test data. And you don't want your model to know that data exists. So you train the model on the training data and you will then validate your model's performance on a test data. Because it doesn't make any, if you create a, a model and it's really bad, you can't put that in production. It's just not gonna do anything any good. So the test data is gonna give you that accuracy and other metrics that are important to understand if it's actually worth putting into production or not. And normally this is like an 80 to 20% split. So you usually keep about 20% for testing and 80% for uh, actually training. So once that's done, you need to clean up your data and transform it. Uh, if you have missing values, they need to go. If you have uh, text values, they need to be numbers. Uh, you can't throw in text values to a um, machine learning model. It needs to work on floats or numeric values. And there's tons of ways of doing this. So it's not super uh, difficult. But just know that uh, there needs to be a transformation process here to make something that is dirty uh, useful. And I will say that ML.net really has uh, a lot of things going for it because it's very easy to chain different transformers on top of each other to make it uh, clean and make it in the structure a machine learning model will understand without too much effort. So yeah, great, you have the data, it's all clean. Now you come to the training and now you become a data scientist, right? Because your data is clean and it's a good shape and you're supposed to train your model right now. Well, I will disappoint you with saying that this step is like one line of code. 
and it's not very eventful. It's, uh, it's the easiest thing ever is to train your model because you need to pick an algorithm. But once you have decided your problem you're trying to solve, you already narrowed down the algorithms you use. And uh, many people get scared of this step uh, when it comes to picking an algorithm. And I would just say, don't be, because even if you've been a data scientist for many, many years, you will still try multiple algorithms for your model. The, the only thing that will happen when you've done this for a few years is that you will know beforehand which one is likely to be better than the other one because it's very data dependent and it's very problem dependent. So you will need to try multiple uh, different uh, variations and you'll see how good they are and you'll pick the one that's good. So just get started and pick one and see how good it is, then try another one and see how good it is and so forth. I think that's just the, the iterate, uh, as we do with software engineering, just iterate, iterate, iterate here. Cool, so we have a model and it's trained. Once you've done that, you want to evaluate that uh, and see how good it is to check for accuracy and check for F1 score and so forth. And I think I've got a question here on the chat here. So let's read that real quick here. Uh, it's difficult for me to conceptualize encoding a string as a, some number, take a low, how do you transform that hashing? Great question, and we'll see some examples today. So when it comes to something like hello, hello is a textual value, which uh, in a specific column would be, uh, let me take an easy example first, actually. Let's think, we have, let's think we have a data set of cars or people with cars, and each person has a different type of car. So we have an Audi, we have a, a Honda, we have a Hyundai, whatever, right? But there's a finitive number of types of cars. Right? We don't have an infinite number of cars. There's a finite number. That means there, we can put labels on them. So in theory, we can swap a, a Hyundai to three and uh, something else to four. Uh, so that's an easy way. It's called label encoding. It's generally okay, but not preferred. The best way of doing it in that scenario is to do something called one hot hash encoding. And that means that we take each uh, permutation and we create a new column for it, a binary column. So we'll create a column that is called is Audi, and it's gonna be zero or one in it. If it's one, if they have it and zero otherwise, then is Hyundai with zero or one and so forth for each type in that column. And the library does it for you under the surface. You need to worry about it. This is one line of code and we'll do it for you. But if we have a scenario as you're uh, describing it, Fred, with hello, that's usually like a, a text. Maybe it's a review of some sort or another version. Uh, what we do then instead is use something called uh, feature grams, or n-grams or char-grams. So uh, we have a transformation model here to split each word up or the text up in smaller words and then conceptualize vectors of those words themselves. Uh, and it's kind of technical in, under the surface, but in general, like in that kind of scenarios, we do something called featureization and it's also one line of code. But the, the separation here is that if we have an infinite number of some sort of string values, we featureize it. If we have a finite number, we do something called either label encoding or one hot hash encoding. But we'll see an example of it. I know it's very abstract. Cool. All right, so evaluation. So once the model is trained, we can evaluate it. And what we wanna do here is we want to understand how good it is. And I'm sure you heard about, you know, like accuracy being one of those things you can measure, right? Is it like 90% accurate or 95? And in many cases, that's good. Uh, you definitely want to check that. But in, in some cases, it doesn't really make any sense because uh, take, for example, a binary classifier, uh, which is uh, determining one of two values. For example, fraud. We're saying it's fraudulent or not fraudulent. So it has two values. It's a binary classifier. If we are feeding uh, the data uh, only non-fraudulent cases to train on, it's going to be biased. And it's going to say that everything is not fraudulent. No problem. There's no fraudulent cases because I have not been trained on that. So we will probably get the model as 99% accurate, but it's crap because it will never find a fraudulent case, if that makes sense, because it is based on the data. So accuracy is going to be a lie then because, yeah, of course, it's accurate based on the data it's trained on, but it's not accurate in the real world. Uh, so that's when we have things like recall and precision and more advanced metrics uh, that you can read up on. Uh, and they have, in general, like data science is very good at making complicated names uh, to kind of push people away, I think. Uh, but they are under the surface really simple things. Like if you just read like precision recall, they make a lot of sense. Like recall, what that means is 
how many uh, false uh, negatives do I have? And what I mean with that is how many fraudulent cases did I miss, right? Of the one I should get. So if I have a really high recall, I didn't miss any cases. If I have a low recall, I missed every fraudulent case. So it sounds complicated, but it actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it a bit. Cool, so just be aware of the accuracy, I guess, here. Uh, so once you have done that, we get to the last part here, and this is really where library shines, like deploying a model. And this is where I'm, I get really excited about this, um, because ML.NET can be seamlessly integrated into your uh, ASP.NET Core application, your desktop app, Azure Function, put in Docker container, you know, do whatever you want with it. It's completely up to you. But the key here is that you can call it as a method in .NET. If you do this in scikit-learn, TensorFlow, or something like that in Python, it will almost always be uh, a Docker container. And you have to call that over HTTP and RESTful. And that's all good, but what if you want to do offline capabilities? It's a bit more difficult then. Or what if you just want to have a simple model and you just want it as part of your method? It, take, it takes you like 50 milliseconds to make a prediction. You want to just integrate it into your app. You don't want any external communication and so forth. And that's where you can really get benefits here because this is just another method uh, and just another method call. All right, so before I go into the last part for coding, I wanna stop here and see if you have any questions. You can unmute yourself or put something in the chat. Any? Uh, I, I had a quick one. Um, it, this has been like a super great introduction to all this. And, and this question may, you may end up just saying I'll answer that at the end, but I, uh, I've heard the, the library TensorFlow a lot in the past. And I yep. just noticed there's actually like a .NET version of TensorFlow. How does ML.NET compare to TensorFlow and, and TensorFlow.net? Yeah. Great question. Let me follow up that in the next slide. Okay. Well, that's, Perfect. Yeah. It's a great question. I'll, I'll make sure we make the distinction here. So like TensorFlow is definitely one part of this library, right? When we talk about machine learning, the first thing people think about is Python mostly, and then some R as well. But Python is the overwhelmingly big community because in Python, you have TensorFlow. TensorFlow is Google's flagship, it's in, it's in Python. Actually, it's not true, it's in, in C++, but it has a, ten, it has a Python uh, binding on top of it. And people usually use Keras, which is like the, the simplified version of TensorFlow. But regardless, they think about Python and R, and they don't think about anything else, even though Python is really slow <laughs> and really bad memory footprint. Uh, so about two years ago, Microsoft announced ML.net to kind of counter that a little bit. And they've used this internally for many, many years, but it open sourced it about two years ago. Um, and it's an open source platform. Uh, it has a GitHub repo, you can go there and contribute. I've done that a few times and uh, you can open issues or PRs and just get part of the community. But the cool thing here is that it has support for a lot of things. Foremost is .NET focus. So it will be focused on .NET and you can deploy it as .NET. It has auto ML capabilities, so you can, you can you can throw data at it and it will give you back a model without any knowledge of machine learning. So that's a really good start. It's not always the best endpoint, but it's a good start if you're curious of what's gonna do. Uh, when it comes to something like deep learning um, that you were talking about here with TensorFlow, it, it's not, I, what I really like about it is it's not trying to reinvent the wheel, wheel. Like if you talk about deep learning, everyone's gonna say TensorFlow and TensorFlow is great. So why should we try to reinvent that? And ML.net is not trying to do that. It's actually building on top of that. So just like Keras is trying to build Python uh, bindings on top of TensorFlow, uh, so is ML.net. So uh, with that said, we actually use TensorFlow under the surface when we train deep learning models in C Sharp as well. Uh, so we can train like computer vision models or option detection models with uh, ML.net. And under the surface, it will call those C++ binaries and uh, train your model for you in deep learning, just like you do in Keras. Uh, and the really cool thing as well is that you can also utilize deep learning models from other libraries that are trained in TensorFlow, but maybe in like real TensorFlow, but you can still consume them in .NET because you have that nice interface and wrapping with ML.NET. Uh, so you can do like uh, natural language processing or something more complex and just integrate those things that are already trained for you. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some really cool things to look into there, but uh, just think about TensorFlow being a separate library. It's not a competitor by any means. It's a complement to .NET um, in some ways here. Scikit-learn is a competitor. Scikit-learn is the Python equivalent. 
Uh, it's not a competitor to per se, but it's the, the equivalent, I would say. So I hope that makes sense. Cool. So the process for training a model in general, uh, when we talk about more uh, .NET stuff here, is that we will load our data into something called iDataView. And it's uh, in-memory data view that represents the data we want to train it on. We will then create a pipeline. So this is where it gets very .NET -y. We're creating deferred methods. So we're calling a method chain. We're just chaining our methods on top of each other uh, in a lazy loading fashion. So we will uh, append a method for transform our data, like replacing null values. We will append a method to be executed later for training the model. We'll append methods for evaluating the model and so forth. And once we hit that fit method, which is where we actually say, okay, let's do it now. We'll execute that method chain for us and feed the model to us. And yes, it's kind of a builder pattern. It's like a method chaining pattern. And that's what I really like because it makes it very .NET -y. It like very nice and friendly and, and like pretty uh, compared to, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop hitting at Python right now, but I'm a .NET developer. I've been in my whole life. And I really like to be able to, you know, take my .NET knowledge and c -sharp experience and apply it to machine learning uh, to new domain. And that's something I couldn't do if I was going into Python, I think. So if you wanna get started yourself here, uh, this is what I recommend you do. You can either go to the community samples, which is the link at the top here. Uh, it has some really good samples from community members uh, where you can kind of inspect the code and uh, get started yourself. And it really spans different ML tasks. So more or less anything you can do with a library, has an example here that you can look at uh, to get a really good start. But then I also suggest that you try it yourself, like download um, data sets from Kaggle and use maybe automatic machine learning to get started because that will also not only feed you the, the, the model, but it will also feed you the code on how you train the model. So you can then uh, look at the code afterwards and understand what it's doing for you. So I think it's just really awesome. Uh, the docs are really good as well, of course. Um, and if you're curious, uh, again, I stream every Tuesday and Saturday and you can always tune in and listen to what I do and ask questions. I also suggest to follow John Wood uh, on YouTube. He has some really good videos, uh, more structured videos on a lot of topics as well. Uh, and I know he's doing a LinkedIn course as well, LinkedIn learning course on this, so he's good to follow. Cool. All right. So that was enough slides, more than I want to talk about. But now I want to do some real coding with you guys. Uh, so uh, if you uh, have questions, just unmute yourself. I will not be disturbed, no worries at all. Uh, but I wanted to do something fun with you today. So what we're going to do today is a quick demo. And I'm going to show you the Kaggle data set here. So if you want to find data, the way, you, the way you usually go to is something called Kaggle. There's many places else as well, but Kaggle is like the open source place for data. And uh, you can find data sets here. And in many ways, the hello data sets, hello world data set for machine learning is Titanic. Uh, and the data set here is very simple, but what it does, it, it contains information about who was on the ship, if they survived or not, uh, which class they were in, like passenger class, uh, what gender they were and age and so forth. And we can use this to train a model to understand if we are going to survive or not, depending on our you know, e, uh, age and what, what have you. So we had the data already, right? That was the first step uh, we needed to. And with this simple CC file, it's a very small set. So how do we get started here? Well, the first thing to do is to start Visual Studio or VS Code, uh, whatever solution you want to use here instead. Uh, and you can create a new product here. And when we trained uh, machine learning models here, what we're gonna do here is just have a console application for .NET Core here. That is always the case you wanna start here. So we're gonna build a console application. You can do it in F Sharp if you want to, but C Sharp is usually uh, what I prefer at least. And we can call it uh, Titanic, Titanic uh, Springfield, give it a good name. All right, get us started. Let's see. So what I usually do when I start training a model is I iterate the life cycle we're gonna go through because that is so important. Once we have the life cycle, everything else is super simple. So I usually just kind of comment out the life cycle here. 
And the things we're gonna do again was loading the data into memory. So we're going to uh, split the data, transform the data, train the model, evaluate the model, right? And then save the model to disk so we can actually use it somewhere else. Those are generally the steps we're gonna do in any model. So even though it's a new ML task, and they may be different for each of those, I like to write this down because it helps me understand what I need to do. All right. So to load the data, we need to have the data in our solution, right? And we can do that by just going to right click on the solution, add existing, and I already have the data locally. So I'm gonna to go to my data locally. I think it's under my C drive. And I think I have a Titanic folder here somewhere. I do, and all existing data. There we go. And to make sure this works, if you do this like this, always right click on it and copy always, because you need to have it next to your binaries when you try to train a model. So we want to copy it to output folder here. Uh, you can also reference this directly on a path if you want to, but I'm gonna use a relative path. So I want it next to my binaries. All right, so we got that loaded. And if you look, open data, you see it's the same data as before. It's just a CSV file here. Cool. So how do we get started? Well. Uh, first of all, we need a dependency, right? So we need to install ml.net. So ml.net is a NuGet package. It's many NuGet packages, but today we only need one of them. But you can do that through your package console or you can go and install it from the nuget.org. And it's called microsoft.ml. If you search for that, you will find tons of different packages here and they are for different use cases. So the main package is what you need today for simple stuff. But if you want to do like uh, specific algorithms or if you want to do TensorFlow, you have those packages here for TensorFlow. You have more like deep uh, image analytics uh, here. So depending on your use case, you will need some of these packages uh, and you will probably figure it out once you get there, which package you need. They're pretty like well named, I would say. But for us, we just need the basic package here because we're going to do a classifier and that exists here. So we'll take that down, accept that, get all our dependencies. All right, cool. So we got that installed. Super in, in a good example here. So to get access to all these methods to start training a model and chaining stuff and calling fit methods, what we need here is ML context. And in ML context, I sometimes I try to explain it as like DB context and entry framework. It's not really the same thing. But an ML context is the almighty god of ML.net. If you look at what it does, if you look at just the definition here, it has different kinds of properties. So it's sorted in different catalogs. So depending on your ML task, so again, the classification is one ML task, you'll find different things underneath it. And you'll find like more general stuff like transformations on a transform catalog. If you want to save your model, it's going to be under save. If you want to load your data, it's going to be under the data property and so forth. So you can kind of dive into these different catalogs here by just going into them. But regardless, you need an ML context to get started. And we got that right here, that's good. So to load the data, we need to call the ML context. And again, where do we find that? Well, you find that on data and something called load from text file. Uh, so we can load it from binary, from a database, from enumerable, from a stream, you, can, you know, whatever you want to load it from but from our case, it's gonna be from a text file. And it's super uh, simple to get us started. Uh, it's gonna be a path and we're gonna use a, a, a relative path. So we're just gonna put data to CSV. Uh, we're going to have to define a couple things here. The first thing is, does it have headers? So should we skip the first row? And if you look at the data, we should, because the first row is the, the titles. So you wanna make sure we skip that because the default is false. So otherwise we'll have an exception. And then you'll figure it out and you'll put that in there. Uh, the second thing to think of here is that uh, normally the default for uh, the separation here is tab separated. And our data is, is uh, comma separated. So we need to put a separated car comma here. Like that. Cool, and it's still red. So what am I doing wrong here? Well, this method here is a generic method. And we have not told this method anywhere at all how our data looks like. It has no idea of the schema of our data. It doesn't know that it should load things like survived and uh, as, a, as a number and passenger class and so forth. So we need to define a quick schema here. 
And that's simple, just like we do in entity framework. And just like an entity framework, we create uh, an entity for this. And we'll say this, we call this uh, passenger, for example, because that's kind of what we're looking at, right? We will say this to be, uh, uh, and, and what we'll do here is we'll add properties for the things we care about. And for time's sake here, we're gonna just do like maybe three properties. But the most important thing we need is always the label. And the label is what we're trying to predict. And in our case, it's survived. That is a label and that is super important because that's like, you know, the whole reason why we do this. Uh, if you look at the rest of the data here, we can pick a couple of things here. So survive is the first column. One means true and uh, zero means false, right? Uh, I think that passenger class is going to be important to predict if you're going to survive or not. If you were in the third class, right, under the deck, you probably died. So that's pr pretty important, I think, as predictor. And I also think that uh, the gender is important. So we'll do uh, P class, uh, gender, and H. I think that's a good uh, thing. And we can do all of them, but for time's sake, we'll just do these. So we'll do prop, prop, uh, come on. <laughs> uh, let's see, so we're gonna start with uh, the P class, right? And then we'll do gender. Uh, this brings up a good point. Um, you're using a float for P class, even though it's a, it's an integer type in the CSV. So yes, good, uh, good. What are we I was doing one, there? Yeah, I, good question. I was actually waiting for someone to ask that question, and you did. Uh, so good. Uh, so the reason why I'm using float is because uh, I'll do this one. M of that only understands floats. It can't work on numeric values uh, other than floats. In some cases, when it's categorical values, you can use uh, ulongs or uints and stuff like that. But when you have a numeric value, it needs to be a float because it will transfer it to a float vector in the background anyway for you. Um, so this is something that you will hit your head in, against the wall in the beginning. Uh, I did it all the time. Like, why is that working? It's just blowing up with like a stupid message. And it's because it needs floats all the time. It's going to what, compute. Sorry, what about decimal or double? Yeah, uh, good question. I would love it to do something else, honestly, but it doesn't. It just floats. So, so ML doesn't really care about uh, the issues with floating point. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's exactly the questions I had in the beginning as well. Um, I just learned that you always need to have float floating point values when you work with machine learning models because um, you will need it in the background anyway, eventually. Great question. So we have these uh, stuff right now, uh, but for us to understand fully, for the library to understand what it's gonna work on here, we, add an, we need to add some attributes. And attribute is just to give us the index of where things are here. And uh, oop, load column zero means, of course, it's the first column uh, that it should kind of map this to. P class is number one here, so we'll do that. And let's see, what else do we have here? We have uh, sex and age, that's, uh, that's three, I guess, and four. Okay, did I copy that one? No, I didn't. Okay, so that's three and four. All right, so this is gonna give us a schema that we want to load the data. So if you do that now, we can just use an generic here and pass in passenger, and it will now know how to map that data. So when we get the data view back here, we can actually work on it as well. All right, so we have the data in memory, which is good, it's a good start. Now we wanna split it. So remember that we wanted to have 20% of our data or so to, to test the model on later, and then the rest to train it on. And the good thing here is we can use the, the, the library to uh, split it for us. So we can do data, I'm oh, sorry, ML context, uh, I think it's on data, test train split. I will just pass in the data and from that, it will actually create just an object with two properties, a test set and a training set. So does someone see any issues with this? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't split our, our data. Good, yeah, so we split our data actually here. So if you look at this model here, method, it will do it for us because it will actually say, uh, keep 10% here as test data and the rest as train data. So it will do it for us. But what happens if you rerun this now? 
one more time. Do you think you get the same split? Probably not. Yeah. It's random. Exactly, it's random. So if we do that, every time we rerun it, we'll have different data to train a model on, which means we'll get a different model. So we'll get different accuracy and everything will be just different. Uh, and that's not what we want. We don't want it to change just because we changed uh, uh, when we run it again. Uh, so that's something, we have a concept called deterministic randomness to help us with that. And what we say here is we can put a seed on our ML context. And all it does is says, please be random, but be random the same way each time. So that's deterministic randomness. Uh, and that really helps us in this case. So if you rerun this, we'll have the same accuracy now. But if you left the seed out here, it would be random every time. So strange concept, but I think it's important to, to touch on. All right, so now we're ready to do some magic here. Um, we are now in uh, the transport set. So now we can go into more machine learning. So what we're gonna do here is create a pipeline, first of all. So we can call it a data processing pipeline, uh, which is going to be holding all those methods. So on the ML context here, on transforms catalog, we have access to all of these different transforms. And there's just a couple of things we need to do here. But the first one being the fact that um, uh, we need to do something about the gender, because the gender is male or female in text. And again, that's not gonna work. So we need the library to transform that to numeric values for us. And the way we want it to be done, because we only have two values, is to transform it with new columns for like is male or is female with a zero or a one in those columns. So it's called one hot hash encoding. And that is pretty straightforward once you know where it is. Uh, we'll just do one hot encoding actually right now. Uh, it's on categorical one of the coding and all you need to pass in here is the name of the column. So we'll do the sex column here like that. Uh, and I usually use like the name of because then if you change that name, it's gonna change. But you can use some passing a string if you want to. So that's all we need to do for that column. The, the library is now going to do everything in the background for us and make sure that's a numeric value that we can use in our model training. The next thing to do here is some data cleanup. If we look at the data here, we notice that we have a missing value in H, for example. So for uh, William Henry, I think, uh, he, his age was not recorded for some reason. So we have a missing value here. The rest looks pretty good. But if we leave this missing value here, we're gonna have uh, an outlier in some ways and it's going to affect the model. It's gonna be strange to have someone without an age. So we need to do something about this. One way of doing it is just to remove the, the row. Honestly, that's a way of doing it and it's an acceptable way. Uh, but the most common way of doing it is to try to calculate an average for this person and replace this average uh, here. Uh, you can also put the max value or a mean value or, a, or a, something else there. But usually what we do is the, the mean value here. Um, and there's ways of doing that, of course. But we'll, what we'll do here is append a new transformation. So you have that first method right here, right? This is a transformation. And to that, you chain the next, next method. So you append something. So you'll append a new transformations here. And what it's going to be is replace missing values. And the missing value column, or the column we need to replace is gonna be age. And the only thing we need to do here as well is to find how to replace it. If we leave it blank, it's gonna use the default way, which I think is max value. Uh, but we can also uh, tell it what to do here. So we can say uh, replacement mode, I think, with the name parameter. And we can also then use an enum that's provided here. And it's very verbose, but basically you have an enum here that you can use and you see you have default value, maximum, minimum, or minimum. And I'd like to use mean. Why isn't there uh, a median? Good question, actually. I don't know. That's something to add to the library, I think. I think one thing that I miss, like one thing, if I would do this in like professional setting, I wouldn't do this way. And the reason why I wouldn't do this way is because it's not representable to, of the population. So, for example, take a look at this. This is who, who is missing here. Mr. William Hall, Alan Henry. He's a male. He is in uh, the third class. Okay. That tells you quite a bit, I think. It, I think the average age is going to be very different depending on passionate class and the gender, most likely. So it's likely that we have it, we will get a better average age if we just looked at the subpopulation of people in the third class of that gender. 
So if you average all of their ages, we will probably have a much better estimation than we have if you average all the children and all the females and everyone else in different passion classes. So uh, in a professional setting, we probably do something else here and append uh, another kind of method. Uh, and I actually haven't found a good way of doing that yet in the library for just like these kind of transformations. But it's a good question of a median. Would, a would this be a good case to like do some uh, data prep before you even have your... Uh, yeah models doing the transforming for you exactly if i would do that that would, that would be a way of doing it as well and you can do that in Jupyter notebooks just like you can do in in scikit learn um, and there's something called you know if, if you know uh, pandas in, in python um, there's this, the same thing like data frame uh, they also have that in the net now a data frame where you can do all these kind of things as well so once you get more advanced you probably want to use something like that to prep your data and then feed it into your models all right, cool. So we're almost done with transformations. The last step you want to do here is to decide which columns you want to include in your training. So just because you loaded all the data doesn't mean you need to use all those features because sometimes you want to skip some or you want to create new ones or something like that. But what we'll do here is create a features vector and it can be called whatever you want to. It doesn't need to be called features, but I dare you to change the name. <laughs> Because if you change the name, you have to override a lot of methods because a lot of methods assumes this is called features. So you can if you want to, but just don't do it. It's going to cause a lot of issues. So call it features. Um, and actually what I need to do here is append stuff. So we're gonna append a concatenate method for our vector here, sorry. And again, those things exist on the AML context. Everything's always on the AML context. So we can call this concatenate method. And what that does is that it will output a float vector in multidimensional space called features based out of the columns we pass in here. So we're gonna say, okay, I want, I want you to care about the age. I want you also to care about the sex. Uh, that will do name off here. And finally, I also think you should care about uh, what's the last one? Passenger class, I think. So name E class. That tells the machine learning model here uh, or the training pipeline here that this is what you need to focus on. All right. And I probably missed the parentheses. All right, so there we go. So this is a pipeline. So now we have a pipeline. So when we execute this, all of these things are gonna happen. We're gonna uh, Encode this column, we're going to replace missing values here, and we're going to create a, a vector in space with these specific features we want. So these are features, right? So now we go into the uh, kind of simpler stuff, I would say. Oh, this is actually... I, I'm sorry. I'm going to be a pain in the ass this whole meeting, just no flying. No, go for it. I uh, it. When, you, when you say vector, are you speaking in terms of like the mathematical vector, or are you speaking yes. in terms of, okay. Yeah, I'm speaking about a mathematical vector. So everything is going to be, I mean, machine learning in general is, is matrix multiplications. Uh, that's what happens under behind the surface here. So we are doing matrix algebra and uh, we are uh, doing that together with weights and biases that kind of fit the data together. Uh, so yes, that kind of vector. But the cool thing with this library is that you don't need to know all this stuff. You just need to be able to use it. Uh, and the more you do it, uh, the more you can kind of dive into behind the surface if you want to. All right, so training a model, this is where you need to uh, actually pick the algorithm. Uh, and you will do that by creating something called a training pipeline. And again, you will take your previous pipeline and append your algorithm. So this is where you have to choose what algorithm to use. And the options you have, is going to be under ML context and then under this problem you're trying to solve here. So you see here we have like, Anomaly detection, right? We're not doing that today. We're trying to predict if you survive or not. So that's not anomaly detection. Uh, clustering is different, right? We're not clustering anything. Uh, forecasting, nope. That would be like numeric numbers, uh, sales, whatever. So what we're doing today is binary classification because we're classifying something either as true or false, two values. So survived or did not survive. So if you go into that, we have something called trainers which is the, the name for algorithms. And here we will find the algorithms. 
So you have something like average perceptron and some logistic regression and what have you. And there's many more, but they just exist in other packages. So you saw all those packages before. If you look at those, you'll find additional ones here as well if there's something specific you want to use. Uh, for our case, we can use something simple like uh, uh, logistic regression. And I prefer this one, it's just simple. Uh, that will do the trick for us for sure. And uh, what we need to do here is just define the label column. So we need to tell the model here, what kind of column should I fit the data against? What is my correct values? Where my like ground truth is? Um, so we'll do that by saying label column name. And in our case, it's gonna be name of passenger. and uh, It's going to be survived. All right, getting close to that now. So that's a pipeline. Now our pipeline is set up. Now we actually want a model, a train model. And that is as easy as saying train model, training pipeline, fit. And passing in the train data. So everything above here, everything above is lazy loaded. Nothing is gonna happen before we call fit. Fit is what's gonna execute this method chain for us. And it's going to execute that on our training data. It's gonna feed in our training data. And for each row, it's gonna do all these things and enumerate, enumerate, enumerate until we get a good model here. Uh, but the library decides. Cool. So this gives us our train model. And the final piece of the puzzle here is to understand how good the model is. And then we're just gonna run this and see what we did get here. Uh, so when you want to evaluate something, you wanna do two things. First of all, you wanna take your train model and you wanna just throw it at all the test data that we have saved aside, right? And you want it to transform those uh, rows and make a prediction. So like on data I hasn't seen before and say, please tell me if this is survived or not survived. Uh, so we will, we will get a metric, we will get like a prediction, but we'll also get a score with that. Say, okay, I am 80% sure that this person survives or I'm 90% sure this person dies. And those uh, predictions can then be used to calculate accuracy and other scores to understand like how far off they were. Because if, like for example, if we would uh, predict all of them correctly all the time, you would get 100% accuracy and so forth. So first thing, of course, is to get those predictions. And you can do that by doing a train model, I think. Uh, I think there's a transform method. Yeah, okay, transform, and then test data. And that's gonna give us predictions here. And it's gonna be an iData view of predictions. Those predictions doesn't do anything because we want the raw metrics. Uh, and the metrics are those things like accuracy, F1 score, those kind of stuff. And we'll get that by just uh, uh, calling an evaluation method on our ML task. So again, we go to ML context. We do we use the ML task we're trying to solve here because each ML task will have a different way of evaluating the results. Because that kind of depends if you're doing a ranking problem or something else. But we'll find it here and under evaluate. Uh, and I think evaluate is the, the method, I think. Um, and we'll pass in the predictions here we'll let it know which column is actually the, the true column, which is going to be passenger survive. And I think that is all. Cool. That should be it. So now we should get metrics here. So if we're happy with our model here, what we'll do here is save it to disk. And this is the final step. It is model.save uh, and we'll what we need to do here is pass in the model, which is the train model. We also need to pass in uh, the schema, I think, and uh, we can get that from the train data. Schema, right, I think. And then finally the path here. So we can say, call it the classifier, dot zip. And the thing here is that every model that we create is a zip file. In Python, it's a pickle file, pkl. In uh, MLNet, it's a zip file. It's very Microsoft-y. Uh, and a zip file contains kind of those weights and biases that we use to train the model. It contains the schema, uh, and everything uh, the, the library needs when it's going to load this into an actual function or whatever. All right, so how many think that this is going to work? <laughs> Let's see, late on a Wednesday. What did, you, what did you say your seed was? Uh, my seed was one here. 
uh, I'll give you a 20% chance it uh, fails. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I haven't done any typos here or anything else, but we'll see. It's late on a Wednesday. But, I mean, it's uh, 35 lines of code, and uh, it's definitely more you need to write, but let's see if this works. I'm going to get this over here. So when we hit F5, you know, it's a console app. So it's going to hit a console app. And let's go just debug this. So you see there, we loaded the data in like no time because it's just laser loaded. It's not actually loaded. We'll split it also quickly and the pipeline is really quick. And this is where we get to the fit method. Our data is very, very small. So it's going to be quick to train, train this. But if I hit F10 now, it trains it and then it's done. So it's super quick, uh, most because the data is very small, but also because it runs on the .NET Core and C++ under the surface, which are both very, very performant. So the model is trained here. Uh, if you want to evaluate this, we transform our test data and then we get the metrics. And if you look at the metrics here, we have all our values. So we can look at how good this model is. And it's a little bit small, I'm sorry for that. Uh, let's see if I can find a magnifier. Oh, wow. Metrics. So you see here that our current uh, accuracy is 85%, 85.3%. And we have tons of other metrics too. And depending on what you're trying to solve, you have different kind of metrics. But in general, you always have accuracy. The other things here are specific for your task you're trying to solve here. And depending on your data, they may be more important than others. Like, for example, for classifiers, precision and recall is like life and death. Like these needs to be uh, close to one. In general, when you look at metrics, there's only one good takeaway here. When you look at metrics, they should always be one. There may be uh, like a 10% that should be close to zero, uh, like uh, log loss entropies, but almost everything here wants to be one. So if you have something close to one, it's good. So like these values here are really good, like 87, uh, 91, they are really good. Like we should be really happy with that. This one is a little bit low, uh, could probably be a bit higher. But it depends on your use case. If you're predicting cancer patients, right? So you definitely want a high uh, accuracy on everything because it's life and death. If you want to you know, do a recommendation engine for your clients, uh, you're just happy if it succeeds sometimes, but it doesn't really, it's not life and death if it fails. So it really depends on the use case on how good these things should be. Cool. Uh, what was that confusion matrix? Was it yeah. interesting? Interesting thing. Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So confusion matrix. Um, let me see if I can explain that in a good way. Um, I'm going to open up a workshop I have actually just for that because I think I have a better visualization there. Um, confusion matrix is what the name implies. It tells you how confused the matrix is or the model is. I think I have a pin here. What percent are you confused at, Levi? Uh, almost, yeah. To some extent is that. Uh, let's see here, I have this one here. So it's, it is a matrix, uh, as the name implies, and uh, it looks like this, for example. So it's going to have the classes you're trying to predict on the side. So in our case, it's survived, not survived. In this example, it's fraud or not fraud. And on one axis, you have the predictive values. So this is the predictive values, and these are my actual ground truth. So what it is saying is that in 603 cases that it is actually was a fraudulent case, my model predicted the right value. But it, in, in 21 cases, it said it was not fraudulent, but it was fraudulent. I mean, does that make sense? Totally. Yep. Yeah. So you have awesome. the, yeah. So you want every value to be on the diagonal here. If you have like everything here, that's perfect. It's a clean model. If you have things on the other side here, that's kind of bad because these here are false negatives. And these here are false positives. So you don't want neither. You definitely don't want false negatives because false negatives means that you miss something. In our case, we've got to miss fraudulent cases. So someone's going to be able to use your credit card and you will never know. Uh, and these cases here, someone is calling you from your bank and saying someone used your credit card when they didn't use it. Uh, and the, the interesting thing here when you call, talk about classifiers is that uh, you can never be really good at both. You have to either do really good at positives, uh, true positives, or really good at true negatives. And that's why the bank usually calls you more often than it has to, because it flags like fishy cases that are not actually fraudulent rather than missing them, um, if that makes sense. Cool.
Well, when it comes to that, uh, that was actually what I wanted to show you today, uh, code-wise. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions you have or dive into other areas as well of the library that may interest you, depending on what sure. you Sure. Um, so you brought up the, uh, the, the metrics. Um, and we also have of the um, whether or not they actually passed away or they survived the uh, Titanic. So uh, would you use that to like do another uh, train your model? So would this like happen to loop to do the, um, uh, uh, gosh, what's it? You, you, were, you were talking about it earlier with game development, the- um, Reinforcement learning? Yeah, reinforcement learning. Yeah, so you can, you can do, I mean, you can definitely do that. You can feed them in. Um, People do that for sure. So people put a model into production. Uh, let's say it is uh, for um, you know, classifying your uh, marketing emails. And uh, it takes those new emails that have been classified and then retrains the model on that uh, to make it even better, right? Uh, the issue with that though, is that you can easily get the data drift uh, if the classifications or the predictions were not accurate. And you will feed it in, like uh, you will teach you stuff that was wrong. So you always need a human always to validate, okay, well, this prediction was actually good. I will use this um, in my next training, if that makes sense. But you need a kind of you need a human in between there to actually validate the data is sane. Because if you have the wrong labels in your data, your model is going to learn that and it's going to be crap. So uh, next next question I have is or statement, whatever you want to call it. Um, I did I did or we did brush up earlier on the string uh, and how that's encoded. Um, is there by chance we can actually see like the actual result of that? I don't think so. I think there's a, we can look at it though. Is there something called preview here? I never used it myself. Uh, you can do like, uh, you can do this. I don't think you can get the actual uh, storage, but you can do preview and you can, let's do the train data and do 100. Let's see. Let's see what it does. I haven't used it actually. I know it exists and I use it for other things, but actually not looking at the data. If you do it in a Jupyter notebook, you, I think you will see it better. But I think what it will do at least is gonna give us an idea here. So let's look at it. Okay, preview. So we have nine columns and 100 rows, column view. Uh, yeah, so you see we have two H columns right now. One is the one that is not transformed. One is the one transformed, uh, you know, replacing that value. And uh, I here's the vector one. So you see that uh, instead of creating like two columns, it's creating a vector instead uh, with two dimensions uh, for those things, I think. But yeah, you can definitely dive into this if you wanted to and look at it. some really cool stuff here. But preview definitely seems to give you uh, some kind of view of the data list and what it does here. Um, and it's good, especially if you want to uh, uh, test your transformations before looking at them. Hmm, this is cool. Did not look at this before. Columns. Sparse vector size two, okay. Yeah. And uh, what this uh, library does as well is really cool is that it does something called uh, yeah, dense vectors and sparse matrices. So why that's important is because let's, t let's think about the fact that we have, you know, uh, a thousand different values in that column instead of just two values, right? That means you have a thousand different columns or, uh, you know, in a matrix, a thousand different, yeah, columns, I guess. Uh, but that's going to be a very sparse matrix because you won't have once very often. You will have it like only once per row. Uh, so it'd be a very sparse matrix. And it's going to take up a lot of memory space on your computer. So you may run out of memory when you do that. Uh, but Emelton has a really cool concept of like um, condensing that down into a dense matrix instead. Uh, to save a lot of uh, memory for you. And I don't know exactly how it does that. I just know it does that. Uh, I have an example myself when I used uh, uh, scikit-learn and Emelnet for the same problem. And uh, scikit-learn, uh, you know, threw an outer memory exception for me and Emelnet did not do that. It could handle it for me instead, uh, smart. And it doesn't mean that scikit-learn can't do it. It just means that you have to tell it to do it. Uh, like Emelnet will do it for you. Like it, it will be like, it will understand that I will kind of ha has some guardrails around you and like do things that make sense on the data, which is I really enjoy actually. So I can learn is like a fantastic library and people use it, but you need to really know everything about it, I think. If that is useful. Um, oh, go for it, Levi. Uh, 
I have a couple questions. I'll take one and then I'll, make, I'll, I'll let Fred ask another one. Um, does ml.net support running any of its training on like GPUs? Uh, it does not, but it's in it the not, roadmap. Okay. Yeah, it's on the roadmap, it. uh, but not right now. Everything is CPU intense right now. Got it. Okay. Uh, the only difference would be uh, training uh, deep learning models with TensorFlow. Uh, those ones runs on the GPU because TensorFlow runs on the GPU. Uh, but what we did right now is on the CPU. Cool. Good question. Uh, Levi, why don't you ask your next one? I have a doozy of a question next. Okay. Um, so, so the other thing I was, mentioning, I was wondering is uh, earlier you had mentioned that it's really easy. So you've gone through and you've created this model. Um, and you said that there's a really nice API to like then use that model in an application. Do you have like an example of just like yep. some of the basic code that that looks like? I was curious to see what it is. Yeah, sure. We can do that. And I can also show the uh, automatic uh, version of it as well. So I have a, a repo up uh, on my uh, GitHub if you want to do, look at this example later. And I can just open that as well because that one actually has um, uh, the consumation example as well, I think in it. It's slightly different. I think it's more in depth, but look at that code here. So for example, right here, we have an ASP.NET Core application here, right? So we have a, a controller, just like you would have everywhere else. Uh, and we have something called a prediction engine pool here. And you pass that in through DI and you register as a service. So I can show you that real quick here. So the only thing you need to do in, in your application is to add this prediction engine pool. And you need to define how your data looks like. So the passenger, right, the data is coming in and the model output. And the model output is just the prediction. So that's like survived, not survived, plus a score column, which will tell you how certain it was that it was survived. Uh, and then you just need to define where the file is. And this is just an example, so I do it locally. But what you would do here is probably put it either embedded and do it like that, or you would put it in a blob container and you can do from URI uh, like this and define the, the, the path to that. Because the cool thing with this is that you can also do like this, and where is it? Uh, yeah, watch. You can watch for changes, at least that's what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so you can see if the file changes and then you can, it, it will pull it con continuously and just find a change. And if you deploy a new model, it will just automatically reload it into the pool. Uh, and the reason why we have a pool here is because it's not thread safe. So the pool here will manage the different uh, predictor engines and uh, give you one all the time so it doesn't have race conditions. But when you predict things, the re what you do here is just pass in the view model. In our case, you will recognize a lot of things here. It is, uh, it's just the same columns, just a bit more here, right? We have the survive column here, the P class, all the stuff, more or less everything in the, in this sample. Uh, you'll get the prediction engine and you just call predict and you'll pass in that uh, data and you get a prediction back. And the prediction here is the model output. So if you go on like prediction, which is the survive not here, that's going to be the Boolean um, yes or no, more or less. So that's how you okay. how you consume it. That's pretty that's pretty simple. I like it. Yeah, it's uh, not a many lines of code. And if you do an Azure function, it's the same idea. The only difference is that in the of startup class, you create a startup class, and it's a slightly different syntax, but it's very similar to registering this. And then you can just pass in the engine and then predict things from there. So um, and you can do the same thing in Deswap, and you can also just wrap the whole API in the Docker container. And uh, you know, deploy as a Docker container uh, with an endpoint that you can hit all the time. It depends on how you're going to use it. Cool. Uh, does anyone else have questions? OK. Uh, so you mentioned uh, at the start of this presentation that you contribute open source. And that's to ML.net, right? Partially, but I also run my own project um, okay. that, that I focus <laughs> mostly on. And that's what I stream about. And I think that's what Dave has seen as well. So ML.net, I try to contribute when I have time, um, but that's not too often anymore. Uh, but one thing that we're missing here, uh, like if you look at this flow right here, right? If you want to do this in production, uh, let's look at the code here. Uh, where does it go? Well, maybe I close it. Well, let's say you train a model, all right? Um, and then you have it in production. Where do you store the model? You definitely don't store it in GitHub because it's going to be too big for GitHub or TFS. And how do you know how good the model was? Like, do you have, where do you put that information of how good it was? Uh, where do you store like the association with the data that you train it on? What happens if you change the code? Are you going to retrain it? So like, how does it work with DevOps and this general source control, those kind of stuff? And there's a concept called MLOps for this to manage the lifecycle of the model and track everything and to check data drift in production and monitor the outputs and inputs. Like 
MLOps or like managing machine learning models is like taking DevOps times three. You have multiple dimensions of, of change and it gets very complicated real quickly to make sure you understand how good your model is and where it came from. And especially if you're like in a city like me in DC, where the federal government is uh, having regulations on these things, you need to be able to prove or like tell them w why a model did something and, and how you train that model. Um, so in the Python world, there are tools for this called like MLflow or Neptune and stuff like that. Uh, and you also have Azure Machine Learning, which is also like a managed MLOps service, which will track these things for you. But the issue is all of these things is for Python and Python only. There's no support for .NET. Um, and I spoke to the program manager at Azure Machine Learning about, can you open up for us, please? And he said that, uh, no, more or less. Uh, not right now, at least. Uh, so what I started doing is uh, our own tool for this, for this community called mlops.net. And uh, uh, we have about a couple of contributors right now uh, helping out here. We have open issues and PRs, and uh, we have some new packages out there for different storage providers. So you can uh, track these things in AWS or Azure or SQL Server, or whatever you want to. Uh, but it, what it generally does is that it provides you with that way of like saying, okay, uh, can you track my data? Uh, what was the dimensions on it? Can you, uh, you know, okay, this is the model metrics, but can you please store the model metrics somewhere and associate that with this model? So if I need to check it out later, I know where it is. Uh, so that's the idea. And eventually it's, we're also going to add support to, uh, for deployments, right? So we can actually expose our models through a storage container in some ways, so people can consume them. We can, um, you know, use Roslyn to generate uh, the code for Docker container, this kind of stuff. That's fantastic. Um, so how can uh, we contribute um, to, to the community? Fantastic question. You can, um, so I, I stream on Tuesdays and, and Saturdays on this topic. This is what I, I talk about mostly. And uh, so you can either tune in on Twitch if you wanted to and listen in on these things. Um, if you wanted to, let me just open this up. Uh, so I, I stream about this and we kind of work on it together uh, on the stream and then uh, people spin out and do their own thing. So uh, we have a couple of PRs that open from, from Brett and some other people here. Uh, but we have issues, of course. Uh, I try to label some with good first issues that are like easy to get started with, I guess, up for grabs. And we also try to, uh, as much as possible, add some information about what to do in each and kind of how it pertains to the larger picture. And last week, we also did like a roadmap in general to understand of like, okay, well, it comes to data, what are the data management things you want to do here and training, what do you want to capture and so forth here. Um, so we are like, we started doing this in May. So uh, we're still early in stage here, uh, but we've gone really far so far, honestly, and uh, we're slowly progressing here. Um, it's, yeah, it's on my free time. <laughs> so as much as I have time to organize this, I, I love to do it. It's definitely one of my passions for sure. Um, one thing I wanted to mention though, since you asked, uh, there's also virtual ML.net uh, Slack channel that you can join. Um, where is that? One second. Uh, let me I'll actually check Twitter. One second here. So there's, uh, let me open it here. We did a conference in May for virtual ML.net uh, for anyone interested there. And what we did is create a Slack channel that still lives. And we use that to um, kind of communicate about these things and uh, uh, do stuff. And I'll put it in the, in the chat here for anyone who wants to join as well. Uh, it's completely open and uh, it's just a way for us to communicate. We also have a Gitter channel as well for the open source repo. But yeah, I hope that helps. But yeah, definitely just tune in. Uh, there's a lot of people just tuning in sometimes, doing one issue or um, continuing there as well. I also, uh, you know, I definitely would like you to look at the uh, ML.net repo as well, because that's, uh, you know, there's some really smart brains there, some really cool stuff being done. And they, uh, they would love people to contribute. The Microsoft team is actually smaller than you think it is. Uh, and most of these contributions right now are from the uh, communities as well, so. Um, this is the repo. It can seem very daunting, um, but I have a video on a stream a month ago where I pull it down, um, build all the C++ binaries and uh, contributed to one of the issues there. 
to show the flow of how it's done. So if you kind of want to do this, you can watch that video and, and get started.